Hi, I'm Neil Busis, and Dr. French and I are going to talk about seizures today. First, our disclosures. I have received personal compensation for serving as alternate CPT advisor for the American Academy of Neurology and for AAN speaking engagements, and Dr. French's disclosures are listed on this slide as well. We'll first start with talking about when, where, and why seizures occur. Seizures are sudden, brief attacks of altered consciousness resulting from abnormal bursts of electrical activity in the brain. These disturbances can last from seconds to minutes and can manifest as changes in behavior, sensation, or motor control, or they may cause psychic symptoms or cognitive changes. The manifestations of any seizure depend on where in the brain the seizure arises and where its effects spread to. About 10% of adults experience a seizure at some time in their lives, and thus having a single seizure does not necessarily mean that a person has epilepsy. We just want to emphasize the difference between a seizure and epilepsy. A seizure is the event, and epilepsy is the disease associated with spontaneously recurring seizures. The criteria for the diagnosis of epilepsy from the International League Against Epilepsy has one of three elements, either at least two unprovoked or reflex seizures occurring greater than 24 hours apart, or one unprovoked or reflex seizure and a probability of further seizures similar to the general recurrence risk, which is at least 60% after two unprovoked seizures occurring over the next 10 years, or the diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome. By a conservative estimate, 50 million people worldwide have epilepsy. One in 26 people will have epilepsy at some point in their lives, and 5% of persons report a seizure at some time in their lives. Epilepsy is more common than autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease combined. The onset is highest in childhood. There is then a plateau from about 15 to 65 years of age and then a rise again among the elderly. But people can develop epilepsy at any time and sometimes without warning or prior disease. Why do people have epilepsy? This generally follows the one third rule. There are about three possibilities. There has been an injury or localized disturbance in brain structure and function that results in an electrical disturbance. That's about one third of the patients. And another third, the individual has a genetically acquired tendency towards seizures. And in the other third, the cause of the epilepsy is unknown. There are known risk factors for developing epilepsy. As you can see, one of the biggest ones is complex focal febrile seizures that can lead to epilepsy in 25 to 50 percent of patients. Penetrating head trauma, 25 plus percentage. Non-penetrating head trauma, less than 5 percent. Meningitis or encephalitis, 5 to 22 percent. Alzheimer's disease, 15 percent. Stroke, 20 to 30 percent. And subarachnoid hemorrhage. 20% to 25%. This graph shows the age-specific incidence of epilepsy that I showed previously. You can see that there's a plateau between ages 15 and 65 with an increase incidence in childhood and in many studies an increase after age 65. The response to treatment is not 100%. About 40% of patients do not gain seizure control with medication, and 30% have life-altering daily effects of medicine. This table is from a paper in 2000 called Early Identification of Refractory Epilepsy. And it shows the success of anti-epileptic drug regimens in patients with previously untreated epilepsy. Their response to a first drug is 47%. Their response to a second drug is 13%. Their response to a third drug that is seizure-free during monotherapy with a third drug is 1%. And seizure-free during therapy with two drugs is 3%. So the total 
percentage of patients that are seizure-free is only 64% in this study. Seizures can have a profound effect on a patient's overall quality of life. The medical, social, and economic consequences of poorly controlled seizures can be substantial. Seizures can have negative effects on many aspects of a patient's life, including driving, lost productivity and economic security due to unemployment or underemployment, family relationships, social interactions, stigma and social isolation, and increased mortality. Epilepsy is associated with several comorbidities, and in some cases, the severity of comorbidities can outweigh the burden of the seizures themselves. Common comorbidities include cognitive dysfunction, anxiety, cardiovascular disease, depression, sleep disorders, and migraines. There can be profound consequences of uncontrolled seizures. These can include shortened lifespan, either through SUDEP, which is a sudden, unexplained, uh, unexpected death of epilepsy, which we'll talk about in a minute, and status epilepticus, bodily injury and hospitalization, developmental delay, neuropsychological and psychiatric impairment, including depression and reduced quality of life, social disability, including reduced employment and marriage rates. Epilepsy can kill. This is about sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, or SUDEP. SUDEP is defined as the sudden, unexpected, witnessed or unwitnessed, non-traumatic and non-drowning death in patients with epilepsy with or without evidence of a seizure excluding documented status epilepticus lasting greater than or equal to 30 minutes in duration, in which the postmortem examination does not reveal a structural or toxicologic cause for death. And when you compare years of potential life loss from SUDEP with selected other neurological diseases, SUDEP ranks second only to stroke. You can see that life years lost due to neurologic diseases from SUDEP is greater than ALS, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and meningitis and encephalitis. So this is a major consideration. So I'm done now with my portion of this talk, and I will hand it over to Dr. French. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Busis. And uh, I am here to talk a little bit about classification of epilepsy and also how we treat different types of epilepsy. Now, some of you might have been confused over the last decade because the International League Against Epilepsy, which is the organization that is responsible for epilepsy and seizure classification, had a little bit of a wobble. In 2010, they published an organization of epilepsy and seizures, and that was in place for a few years, but really was not ideal. And so in 2016, a new epilepsy classification was published. And in 2017, a new classification of seizures was published. And those are the ones that are currently um, uh, the appropriate ones to use. So both epilepsy and seizures have been reclassified. And it's really uh, important to understand the new classification.